Acts chapter 1, we're in a series of messages that we've entitled. Anybody got a I love my church shirt on? Nobody's got a I love my, there he is, Adam. Stand up, brother, and show them everybody. Turn around. I love my church, yes, yes. We are in the, and those shirts are available at the conclusion of the service, but we are in a series of messages entitled I love my church. As a matter of fact, we ask many of you why you love SoQuest Church and so many of you wrote things on social media, and we got a hold of those things. And so what we are doing is building a series out of what you love about your church. And if you'll remember last week when we kicked this series off, we talked about the key word atmosphere, because we believe at Soul Quest Church that church should never, ever, ever, say ever, ever, ever be boring. Amen. How in the world we can take the living word of God and make it boring, I don't know. But we should never have boring church. So we talked about the atmosphere last week. And today, excuse me, <clears throat> today we're going to talk about a key word called activities. What are the activities of the local church supposed to be? Now this is a two or three parter right here, this activities. And I want to deal with the word of God today because I believe that what God is blessing at Soul Quest Church is so many things, but one thing is that we are going to preach the Word of God. Amen? Amen. We're not going to water it down. The methods change, but the, me but the message always, always stays the same. And so you're going to get that week in and week out. Acts chapter 1, good place for us to start, is in verse 37. Acts 1 and verse 37. If you don't have a copy of God's Word, either look on with a friend. Is it on the screen? Or it's on the screen. Acts chapter 1. Huh? No? Who wrote that down for me? What? Are you sure? Acts 2.37. What did I say? Acts 1.37? That's why I got you on the front row, Adam, right there, brother. Wearing the cool pink shirt today. Amen. <laughs> Only real men can wear pink. Amen? Amen. Acts 2, 37, the Bible says this. Now, when they heard this, now heard what? Peter had just preached the message at Pentecost. And man, was it a message. Man, was it a sermon. The Bible says, now, when they had heard this, heard what? Heard Peter's message, his preaching, they were, watch this, pierced to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, brethren, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, repent, and each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, as many as the Lord our God will call to himself. Verse 40. And with many other words he solemnly testified and kept on exhorting them, saying, Be saved. Friend, look, that's a good word still for today. The word saved is relevant for today. Watch this. He said, be saved from this perverse generation. As we think about this new word, activities, what are the activities of the local church supposed to be? Well, today I want to really hit hard this idea of the power of the word. How many of you know that there is power in the word of God? And so we're today preaching the Word of God and talking to you uh, today about the power of the Word. I want to give you three things, and I want you to jot these three things down. I hope you got a listening guide when you came in. Three things about the power of the Word. Number one, I want you to see at Soul Quest, the Word is priority. At Soul Quest, the Word is priority. God says... He uses, watch this, the foolishness of preaching. Man, there's a lot of things that go on in our churches today. A whole lot of stuff 
Man, we got music. We got all kinds of music. You've got uh, all styles now of even Christian music. Some of you like Southern Gospel. Some of you like, you know, well, I guess if you're here, you probably like what we do. There's all, there's hymns. I mean, there's first, second, and fourth verse, stand and sit. I mean, I've been there and done it all. All of it's good. It, listen, there's no such thing as Christian music, only Christian lyrics. But I love music. And a lot of churches have music and they have the programs and all the stuff. But I want to tell you something, friend. We must always keep priority on the Word of God. The Word. Because the Word is what changes lives. The Word is what delivers us. The Word is what saves us. The message in the Word. So at SoulQuest, the Word is priority. Look, if you will, in chapter 2, not chapter 1. But chapter 2, and verse 41 and 42, the Bible says, So then, those who had received his word were baptized, and that day there were added about 3,000 souls. They continually, watch this, they continually devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. The word of God. It should be, it should always be, and it will always be priority in our church. Now listen to this. We depend upon the Word of God for three things in our church. Number one, we depend upon the Word of God for our doctrine. We don't depend upon a TV preacher for our doctrine. We, we don't depend upon a denomination. There's some great denominations in America today. We don't depend upon a denomination for our doctrine. We depend upon the Word of God for our doctrine. What do you believe? We believe the Bible. We believe what the Bible has to say, what the Bible teaches. We don't believe that we should take anything out. We don't believe that we should add anything to. We should take the Word of God at face value. So understand, friend, that we put priority on the Word of God and we depend upon it for our doctrine, what we believe. Number two, we depend upon it for our duty. For our duty. Now I want to make a statement to you. And many of you have heard me say this on different occasions. But there are some things in life that you don't have to pray about. Well, I thought we had to pray about everything. No, friend, listen. There are some things in life that you absolutely do not have to pray about. For example, you, you don't have to pray and ask God, God, do you want me to be a witness today? Because the Word of God has already told us to be a witness. Mark 16, 15. You see where I'm going with that? We don't have to, listen, you don't have to stop on Sunday morning. I'm, and it's going to get real quiet in here. You don't have to stop on Sunday mornings and say, Hey, God, God, is it your will? Do you want me to be a generous giver to the local church? Don't make me sit down and eat by myself. Why? Because the Bible already said you cannot outgive God, Malachi 3. Amen. And so there are some things in life that we don't have to pray about. We need to depend upon God for our doctrine, for our duty, and then for our decisions. Our decisions. Where are we going? What are we doing? What does the Word of God say? You know, a lot of times I've been in a lot of different kinds of churches and sometimes people want to hide behind this spiritual thing and they put this front up. Well, you know, we need to spend about 14 years praying about whether we ought to reach anybody with the gospel. We need to form a committee and a subcommittee and a committee on the subcommittee. And nothing ever gets done. Friend, I believe with all of my heart that before we make any decisions, we just need to make sure that it backs up with the Word of God. And if it does, go for it. Go for it. The Bible must be priority. We've got to keep it that way. Number two, at SoulQuest, the Word will be preached. The Word will be preached. I, I love uh, Acts chapter, say it with me, 2. <laughs> chapter 2. Verse 37, I love this. Look what he says again. Now when they heard this, 
they were pierced to the heart. Mm. And said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, brethren, what shall we do? Now when I read that, there's a a few words that just kind of jump out at me. One is passionate. I believe with all my heart. And when Peter preached the message at Pentecost, he preached with passion. Now, I know there's all kinds of different preaching styles, and, and uh, you know, and people, some people preach on a stool, some people run around and do, you know, somersaults, some of them, you know, some scream, some, some are louder, some, some, you know, there's all kinds of different preaching. I don't care whatever style, you, but be passionate about the Word of God. And so we're going to be passionate. Peter was passionate, and then it was convicting. You know, we live in a day today where a lot of people will say, man, I don't want to come to church and get my toe stepped on. Hey, preacher, who are you preaching at today? Man, I'm just preaching down in a hole. If you're in that hole, then get you some, amen? amen. Right? I mean, the Word of God is good. I'm not convicting. I'm not telling you anything. Listen, I'm just as messed up as you are. But I'm telling you, we got to preach the Word. And sometimes the Word of God is convicting and it's challenging to us. Praise God. Sometimes it's comforting to us. God knows what you need. He know, but, and also it's life-changing. It's life-changing. That's a key phrase around here. And we see this on a weekly basis. People's lives are being touched and changed by the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's the word of God because we are preaching the word of God. Man, there's a lot of people that can preach better than I can, but nobody can preach a greater gospel than me. Why? Because this is the gospel that changes hearts and changes lives. And we ought to be passionate about it. We ought to be fired up about it. Listen, if we can't get, listen, if a preacher can't get fired up about the Word of God, he ought to go sell shoes at Sears. I'm not, if you sell shoes, that's a great, that's a great career. I'm not, I'm not saying. It's a great, great thing. Are you supposed to have like a, really think about, is it that much at the, at the toe or is it, can I do that? I don't know. But man, listen, I believe that the preacher of the Word of God must be passionate about the Word of God. You see, soul quest, the Word is priority. Number two, at soul quest, the Word will be preached. And number three, we're going to spend most of our time here. At soul quest, the Word changes people. Ronnie Coleman doesn't change anybody. You don't change anybody. This building doesn't change anybody. The music doesn't change anybody. Listen, the, the, the activities don't change anybody. But the Word of God does. The Word of God is life-changing. Write these things down. I got about six of them for you. Number one, the Word is a lamp that brings light. Psalm 119, 105. The Word is a lamp that brings light. The psalmist said, Your Word is a lamp unto my feet and a light for my path. In these days, they would, they would tie a lamp to their feet at night it was an oil lamp and this would give them light as they would walk in the night so that they could see where they were going and they were walking down the road and they could miss a stone or a pebble or a cliff or a tree or whatever or any danger as you read and I read the Word of God as we obey it we can avoid the darkness of this world you see Satan has a lot of traps for us Listen, if you've been living for Jesus lately, if you've gotten saved and you're really living, you've discovered that Satan is out to discourage you. That's what he does. He's trying to discourage us. And Satan has set traps for all of us, and we need to be shown where to go, and we need guidance, and we can only get that guidance from the Word of God. God's Word will show us the way. Write down 2 Peter 1 and verse 19. The Bible says it's a more sure word of prophecy. Peter had, man, he had seen everything. Peter had seen so many things. I mean, Peter had seen God raise the dead. He, he'd seen people healed. He, he'd seen Christ walk on water. He walked on water himself for a little while. 
But in spite of all of that, Peter said there's one thing that's better than visions, that's better than miracles, it's better than seeing dead people rise again. It's the Word of God. The Word of God. It's powerful. God's Word is a lamp that brings light. Number two. Number two, God's Word. The Word is bread that brings strength. Deuteronomy chapter 8 and verse 3, it talks about that. Jesus even said in the Gospel of John, he said, I am the bread of life. The bread of life. John 6, 35, he referred to the manna that the children of Israel ate, and then the Bible says they died in the wilderness. They ate and then they died. I love, anybody remember Adrian Rogers? Great preacher of yesteryear. Matter of fact, he's still on TV and radio. He's dead, but he's still preaching. Isn't that cool? He is. He, love worth finding. Check it out. He's a great preacher. Great Southern Baptist preacher. But Adrian Rogers said one time, you could go to Africa, you could take $5 million, and you can buy as many Big Macs as you wanted to, and give them out to everybody there in Africa. But in six hours, they'd be hungry again. That's why he said this. Boy, it's great. The social gospel is a good thing. But the great thing is to feed people physically, but also feed them spiritually. You see, if all we're doing is feeding people physically and not giving them the gospel, the bread of life that literally changes their life, See, you've got to do both. God's Word is bread that brings strength. A doctor made a study of exactly how much fuel it takes for a person to live a lifetime if he lives the average lifespan. Here's what he figured out. If you're going to live a whole life, you need 6,000 loaves of bread, four cows. That can't be right. That's got to be 40 cows. I can eat 40 cows in a year, man. He said four cows... Eight hogs, and now look, I can eat a lot more than that too. 309 chickens, 70 geese, 100 pigeons. Who eats those? 14,000 pounds of fruit, 5,000 eggs, 10,000 quarts of water, 2,000 large fish, 2,000 sardines, 9,000 pounds of potatoes. Now, I'm, yeah, amen? amen? Fried, mashed, baked, all gratin. Don't you worry about it because when we get done here, everybody will be out of the restaurants. We'll be home free, all right? 12,000 pounds of vegetables, 6,000 quarts of milk, 10,000 pounds of salt, 12,000 quarts of coffee, 800 pounds of sugar. I don't know about you. We were talking this morning. Last time we had a spread here, we had a spread. Amen. We like to eat. Amen? Whether it's barbecue bologna or tenderloin. Amen? Whatever it is, we like to eat. But listen, if we just give physical food and we don't give spiritual food, oh friend, we've got to give both. Meet those needs. The Word of God, the, the Word is a lamp that brings light. The Word is bread that brings strength. And the Word, number three, is a sword that brings protection. It's a sword that brings protection. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 17. Will you go there with me just for a moment? Ephesians 6. If you don't have a Bible, just listen to this. Ephesians 6, verse 17. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is what? The Word of God. You see, God's Word is a sword that brings protection in our lives. This is an offensive weapon he's talking about here. So many times it seems like that the child of God, we, we, we get so terrified of the enemy. They were scared of, the, of Satan. Can I tell you, can I just remind you of something that all of you know? But greater is he that is in you than he that's in the world. And we get sometimes so afraid and, oh, I'm running from the enemy and the enemy's going to get me. No, friend, we have Jesus Christ living in us. We ought to use this weapon, the Word of God. That Word is a sword that brings protection. 
We ought to so know God's word that when Satan attacks, we can use the sword. You know the story of Jesus when he was tempted by Satan. Do you remember what he did? Every time that Satan tempted him, do you remember what he did? He quoted the word of God. Now let's just be real practical for just a moment. Are you listening? Say, I'm listening. Don't, don't answer this, but how many of you right now in your life are struggling with some type of stronghold? Let me define stronghold. Don't raise your hand. Please don't raise your hand. Let me define stronghold. Stronghold is that thing in your life that you keep on asking God to forgive you for, and you're convicted of it. You're a child of God, and you're convicted. Over and over and over again, you say, God, please forgive me. Oh, God, I'm sorry. I'm please. But you keep doing it over and over and over again. Can I, it, this is not in my message, but let me give you just a little word here. Are you ready? Say, I'm ready. If you want to overcome that stronghold in your life, whatever it is, find as much scripture as you possibly could find that deals with that issue that you're going through. Memorize it, meditate upon it, and every time, every time the old devil comes against you with that certain specific thing, quote that word at the devil. And you can tell him where he can go. Amen? Amen? Tell him, say, you go to heaven. Amen. The word, the word, the word, it's powerful. It's powerful. And Jesus was in the wilderness. And every time in, during this spiritual warfare that he was in, he quoted the word. He quoted the word. Let me tell you, every one of us who are living for God and giving God everything that we've got, listen, we are going to be attacked by the enemy. Get ready. Get ready. Everybody say, I'm ready. Get ready, folks. I mean, we, we got some preaching today that basically says, this, oh, give your life to Jesus and everything will be wonderful. There's only one problem with that. It's a lie. Well, why in the world do I want to be saved? Then? I'll tell you why. Because when you do go through tough stuff, you got the Holy Spirit of God living in you to help you through it. It doesn't mean you're not going to ever have to go through stuff. But it's a child of God. Use the Word of God. The Word is a sword that brings protection. Number next, the Word is a critic that brings correction. The Word is a critic that brings correction. Hebrews 4.12 tells us that. The Romans invented a double-edged sword. It was a broad sword. It was not a very long sword. It was a short sword, but it was broad, but it had... On both edges, both edges were sharp. It was double-edged. The Word of God is also a double-edged sword. What does it do? It convicts and it converts. It cuts and it heals. It cuts out the sin with one side and heals with the other side. The Word of God. Friend, listen, I, I don't want to be that church where every time you come in the doors... The preacher is stomping on your toes and telling you how sorry you are. You've been to those before? But also at the other side, I don't want to be that guy that every time you come in, the preacher tells you how wonderful you are. Because there's a balance in between. And the Word of God, I don't have to do that because the Word of God, if we preach the full gospel, if we preach the whole gospel of Christ, what we're going to discover is that sometimes you come to church and you are going to be convicted. You're going to leave here saying, man, alive. That dude's reading my mail. What's he doing? Why is he preaching to me like that? I've gotten emails. What do you know? I don't know nothing. I don't know who you are, man. What do you know? I don't know anything. Sometimes when we preach the Word of God, man, listen, I preached on tithing or giving before, and somebody got upset because of something else. It didn't have anything to do with it, but the Holy Spirit of God convicted them of their sin. By the way, if you are convicted of your sin as a child of God, hey, that's not a bad thing. That's a good thing. That means the Holy Spirit of God is in you and is convicting you. Therefore, that's evidence that you are a child of God. 
not only does it convict, but it also comforts. You see, he has a way. Sometimes you come to church, you don't need to be challenged, or you don't need to be convicted, but you need to be comforted. The Word of God does that, right? It's not the preacher, it's the Word of God. The Word of God is a critic that oftentimes brings correction. What are we on? One, two, three, four, five, or the letter E. The Word is a hammer that brings power. I like this one. Sometime in your own Bible study time, go back and read Jeremiah 23. And specifically, verse 29. Because God's speaking to Jeremiah. Now, Jeremiah was that preacher that preached, and it seemed like nobody was getting saved. Nobody's lives were being touched. It's like, what's going on here, man? I'm preaching, I'm preaching, I'm preaching. He said, it's, it's, not, my, it's, not, my word like a, it's, it's not my word like a hammer that, that breaks the rock into pieces. That's what God said. He wasn't getting anywhere in his preaching. He said, God, everybody's hearts are hard as rocks. I've had preachers tell me that. Preach, I'm not getting anywhere. Just be faithful. Keep preaching the word. Keep preaching the word. God said, my word is like a hammer that breaks the rocks in pieces. Just keep on preaching. Keep on pounding. My word will break the hardest heart. If you take a big rock and you start pounding that rock with your fist, what's going to happen? It's going to break your fist. What if you get that same rock and you get a big sledgehammer? And I put Ben, Ben Smith on a big sledgehammer and a big rock. Guess what's going to happen? It's going to shatter. The Word of God is a sledgehammer. Don't worry about it. You've been after somebody. You've been praying for somebody. You've got a spouse. You've got a husband. You've got somebody who's lost that needs Jesus Christ, a friend, maybe that, that, that's been saying no to you forever. Keep on praying and keep on showing and living and sharing the living, powerful Word of God with that person. Don't worry about it. God will do what God does. Man, I've seen the hardest of hearts get broken by the Word of God. I've been doing this for 24 years. And I've traveled and I've seen a lot of people. I never will forget I was in southern Illinois doing a meeting one time. And uh, <laughs> I was sitting on the front row getting ready for the service where Adam is. And the pastor was sitting next to me. And all of a sudden, he was just turning around, looking at the crowd, seeing if anybody was going to show up or not. You know, it was a revival service. And this big guy walks in the back door. Big guy. I mean, big man. He starts walking down the center aisle, and he sat down. Well, the preacher looks at me, and he says, he said, Ronnie, fear in his eyes. I said, well, what is it? He said, the meanest man in town just walked in the church. I said, great. No! You don't understand. He's the mean. I, I'm not kidding. He's the meanest man in town. Great. We're going to pray God's. But no, you don't get it. This man is so mean. I'm surprised he didn't have a gun in his back pocket. He's mean. Well, long story short, at the end of the service, after he got saved, praise God, pastor said you, you you don't you don't understand me Ronnie this man was so mean <laughs> that he would bring his wife to the grocery store he would give his wife so long to go in and get back out and he would put her on a timer and all the ladies said you gotta be kidding me and he said, he said, if, he, if she didn't get out by the time limit he gave her, he'd go inside and grab a hold of her and pull her out to the car. Just mean, abusive, all the stuff you could think. He was mean. By the way, my wife would whoop me up one side and down the other. That's why I just let her go by herself. Amen. <laughs> Woo! I'm telling you, I don't care how mean... A person is. You say, well, man, I, that person is just too far gone. Nobody's too far gone for God. Amen. You know, Peter 
had done some pretty bad things. Paul was really, really far gone. There's a lot of people in this world that were messed up, really messed up. And God touched them and God saved them. Let me close with this. The word is a seed. Everybody say seed. seed. That brings life. 1 Peter 1.23. The word is a seed that brings life. Romans chapter 10 says, Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. The Word of God is very important. There's no way anyone can be saved apart from the Word of God. And now listen to this. Faith comes by hearing. And hearing by the word of God. John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Ephesians 2, 8, 9. For by grace are you saved through faith. That not of yourself. It's a gift of God. Not of works lest any man should boast. The Bible goes on and on and on. For the wages of sin is death but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Romans Chapter 6 and verse 23. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Romans 3, 23. Isaiah said, we like sheep have all gone astray. John 1, 12 says, but as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons, the daughters, the children of God. It's the gospel. You got to hear it. You got to hear the gospel. You got to hear the gospel. It's got to be planted. That seed has to be planted. We need to stop getting so upset and worrying about whether somebody walks an aisle, whether somebody stands up. That's not our job. Our job is to sow the seed. Now, we rejoice and we have high expectations because our God is in the saving business. I look forward every single week. I look forward to the invitation time. When I say one, two, three, I look forward to people standing up saying, I gave my life to Christ today. Woo, what a powerful thing that is. But that's not my job. I don't make that happen. God does. We just plant seeds and plant seeds and plant seeds and plant seeds and water and let God do what God does. Everyone can be a seed sower. Some people are gifted to draw the net. Some people have the gift of harvest evangelism. But everyone can give a track. Everyone can give money to reach people with the gospel to the local church or to Billy Graham Association or someone. The Bible says in Psalm 126 in verse 6, Madison or somebody come play. The Bible says in Psalm 126 in verse 6, He who goes to and from weeping, carrying his bag of seed, shall indeed come again with a shout of joy, bringing his sheaves with him. You see, the Word of God, the message in the book, the Word of God changes lives. The Word is a seed that brings life change. Friend, listen, this, does not, this is not about the Word of God. This does not contain the Word of God. This is the very Word of God. It changes people. I love the song that Madison and the band have sung and played the last couple of weeks. It changes us. The Word. It's powerful. When so many people in so many churches seem to be putting the Word on the back burner, it ain't going to happen at Soul Quest. Because the Word of God is what brings conviction. It's what brings life change. The Word of God saves and changes. Listen, I got saved at 16 because I sat where you sat and I heard a preacher preach the Word of God. He didn't preach U.S. News and World Report. What is that magazine you like to look at in the grocery aisle? The National Enquirer. Yeah! He didn't preach the National Enquirer. People Magazine filled and stream. All you hunters. He preached the Word of God. 
the Word of God. The Word of God. It changes us. And you may be here today. And you need to be changed. You've tried it on your own. You've tried to fill that void in your life with everything under the sun. Today, you need to fill it with the one this message is where it talks about and its name is Jesus. You need to be saved. Can I talk to you and me, child of God, for a moment? Some of us, we need to recommit and rededicate our lives to the study, the meditation, the memorization, of the Word of God on a daily basis. I've sat down and met with a lot of people. I'm not the greatest counsel in the world, but I've sat with a lot of people that have said something like this. Pastor, I, I, I'm just not feeling it. My Christian walk is just not going where it needs to go. And I just, I don't feel close to God like I used to feel close to God. Okay, let me ask you a simple question. How's your quiet time, your devotional life? How's your prayer life and your Bible study? Well, you know, I hadn't done that in about six months. Out of here, I'd pull it out. You say, that's too elementary. It may be, but it's profound. If you want to grow and have strength, have power to withstand the attacks of the enemy child of God I'm talking to you I'm talking to me listen to me if you want the power to withstand the attacks of the one that wants to destroy your life if you want that power you better you better make time to get in the word stay in the word You say, when? In the morning? At night? You find that time when you can get along with God. Can we say practical one-on-one here? Here it is. Find a time. Find a time. When is it? Is it 4.30? Nobody else is up yet? Not even the birds. Just you and God. Is it 11.30 at night out in the, the man cave? Mom? You have to get the kids in bed and go sit in the car and lock the doors. Lock the doors, though. Lock the doors. <laughs> go sit in the car and turn the interior light on and just read God's Word. Also, I want you to introduce that, what is it called, First 15? I want you to put that somewhere in a message you're going to preach soon. That's a great thing. Give God 15 minutes of your so that's nothing it's better than most Christians give start off get in the word get in the word you say I haven't been in the word in a long time where do I start get, open up the gospel of John just read about Jesus because <laughs> the whole idea is that we become more like our Savior how do we do that know about what he does and how he responds and how he acts how he reacts We've got to get in the Word. I'm speaking to some folks here today, aren't I? We've got to get in the Word, guys. Gals, we've got to get in the Word. If we want to live victorious Christian lives, we've got to make time starting today to get in the Word. I promise you, it will be life-changing. See, salvation is the beginning. But maturity and growth and discipleship is where we go from here. Get in the Word.